and thanks. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Am I audible? And may I uh, request the participants to switch off their video and please don't uh, unmute yourself because it might disturb the speaker. Uh, please switch off. Make sure your videos are switch off, switched off and your mics are on mute. Uh, Basil, Abraham, please, can you, uh, sorry, can you switch off your video? Okay, thank you, thank you. And welcome, sir. Kunyamat, sir. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for inviting me over for this program. Uh, uh, actually, I, I noticed this this workshop part of uh, the title much later. I was I was told that this is a webinar, so. My talk would be, you know, an inaugural talk would be on, on, you know, some aspects of Paul's theory plus, of course, the foundations that I would like to talk about. Original, originally, I was told that I would be speaking to MA students, uh, and later I realized that uh, they're not just MA students; there are a number of teachers as well. So, if teachers feel themselves feel bored with it, or if they feel that it is a little too um, fundamental, please bear with me. You can use uh, the stuff for your class, you know, teaching sessions. And also we can um, speak about this for about, at least for about 15, 20 minutes at the end of the session. I don't intend to uh, talk uh, very long. Uh, so um, let me just make, uh, press open my presentation. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Yeah. My slide is visible <clears throat> and I am audible, right? Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so um, when I was given this choice, um, this the topic choice, you know, I, I thought about um, discussing some aspects of theory uh, that would be foundational knowledge for students, for people who are trying to understand theory. Uh, but then uh, when the brochure was issued, it was actually post theory workshop. Um, I, I, haven't in, I haven't visualized this as a workshop, as I said, so let's, let's get into it. I'd like to play around. Uh, I, I would like to, uh, you know, talk about a couple of um, um, couple of articles that appeared in in um, a collection called Post Theory, which I found very interesting. Um, this this article contains a couple of ideas about about uh, Post Theory, um, which I think would be relevant. Um, I'll just make some preliminary remarks about this and then move on to my actual topic. Uh, this particular um, article is not from uh, McCullin's Post Theory. This is from another collection by Robert Young, you know, the post-colonial writer. But the reason why I, I quoted this is because I would like to play along with this notion of Post a little bit. As I think as the head of the department mentioned, Post doesn't really... Uh, uh, you know, uh, as she was rightly pointing out, some people think that post is the end of theory. But um, <coughs> as we know, there's been a lot of discussion about the end of theory, the death of theory, and so on. Um, how do we psychoanalyze postness? And when you psychoanalyze postness, when you look at the postness of post theory, you know, uh, some interesting uh, points really, you know, come up for discussion. This particular um, quote is from Robert Young, and he's talking about 
the relationship between post-structuralism and structuralism. Just as we would be talking about the relationship between theory and post-theory. If you look at the word post, he says, there are two dimensions to it, the very notion of post, which is actually captured by the word posterior. You know, posterior, we know, means both back and both, you know, behind and both after. The post actually talks about, on the one hand, something that is spatial, which means when you write the word post theory or post structuralism, the place of the word post spatially is at the beginning. So spatiality is a very important thing. When you talk about post colonialism, you know, there is a space, you know, that that at which this particular word appears. It, it always appears at the beginning, but it means after. So it appears behind, before its actual positions. It is especially at the beginning, but then in temporality, it is at the end. In other words, in terms of time, it comes later. Now, uh, for Robert Young and also for Nicholas Royal, whose article we'll be looking at quickly, just for a couple of ideas on post. This is a very interesting psychoanalytic perspective. This provides a psychoanalytic perspective on the perspective on the question. Post-structuralism suggests that structuralism itself can only exist as always already inhabited by post-structuralism, which comes both behind and after. In this sense, Look at the highlighted part. Post-structuralism becomes structuralism's primal scene. So I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Freud's concept of primal scene. Freud's theorization that every child um, you know, experiences as some kind of an unconscious fantasy about, about uh, his parents, childs or her, her parents making love. Um, there have been a lot of... Uh, you know, a lot of discussions uh, regarding this particular concept of the primal scene. Studies have been conducted to ensure, to, to sort of, you know, ascertain whether um, there is any difference in the, th in the psychosexual development of a child, uh, uh, a child who has watched his parents in the primal scene and children who haven't watched. And there are different, very interesting studies. But the point is, from a psychoanalytic perspective, primal scene refers to what a child in its infancy, in its infancy, that's why it's called unconscious. Without, at a time when the child is not aware of what is happening, watches this particular scene of the parents making love. Freud has said that uh, in one sense it's a fantasy, but it's also said that this is an unconscious fantasy, but this really organizes and orchestrates the psycho, bio, psycho, psych, psychological development of the child, psychosexual development of the child. What's happening in this primal scene is that two things are happening. One is for the child, this particular scene of lovemaking between the parents is essentially a violent act. It's a kind of act of violence. In other words, there are two points that the child always thinks of. One is exclusion, because the child is excluded from the scene, which is traumatic for the child, as we know. And that, I think, is one central aspect of primal scene. And then there is the other aspect of excitement. So there is the, the, the concept of exclusion and the concept of excitement here. A child is both excluded and therefore feels a little castrated and you know traumatized at the same time child can you know fantasize this as a moment of exclusion now but freud said that primal scene does not actually even though it happens when the child during the child's infancy it becomes active it becomes powerful only when the child reaches sexual maturity you know, um, Freud was actually talking about the Wolfman case, right? Wolfman, uh, that particular patient or analyst had this problem of, you know, uh, 
of seeing a nightmare about wolves every morning. He would uh, wake up from that nightmare. And it is based on that, uh, you know, Freud theorizes the notion of the primal scene. But what exactly is primal scene? What happens in the infancy is not even known at the time it is happening. It is experienced only when the child actually grows up into a youth. So if there is, the child suffers from sexual, uh, some nightmares or some kind of sexual disorders, it's often attributed to, to the primal scene. In other words, the, the Deridian term, the deconstructive term for that is future anterior, meaning something that will have been, that hasn't happened yet. So a child at the age of one is never aware of primal scene. The same child at the age of 25 is aware of it. This particular temporality is a strange kind of temporality. So when you compare, when you say that post-structuralism becomes structuralism's primal scene, here the structuralism is the infant. Right. Post-structuralism is the primal scene. We become aware of, in one sense, the dangers of structuralism, you know, much later through post-structuralism. What uh, Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Royal actually, you know, uh, uh, uses this very concept in a, and applies it to post-theory. Let's just look at it. You know, he, he talks about the predicament of Postality. It's not simple. It's, you know, what exactly is post? In what way are we post theory? So both these writers draw heavily on Freud's concept of deferred action is just another word for uh, future anterior. You know, future anterior, by the way, is not a term used by Freud. It's a term used by, I mean, widely used by writers like Spivak and Derrida. It refers to the idea that something that happened long back in the past, you know, it becomes a figure of trauma, as you can see. Something that happened long back in the past comes back to haunt you, right? In a different form, at a different time, when you're able to understand things better. When you're able to, when, when you are, when you have more insights about, you know, what that was. In the earlier time, that is when you were an infant, you didn't know that there was a primal scene and that was, no, you, that, that did not really uh, bother you any, in any way at all. Because its impact is to be felt years later. This is exactly what happened to theory in post-theory. I mean, we understand what theory did to us only when we became past it in one sense, you know, post it in one sense. See, post-theory suggests that theory itself can only exist as always already inhabited by post theory, which, come, which comes both behind and after. In this sense, post theory becomes theory's primal scene. This is just a rehash of, you know, a reworking of the same sentence, right? But um, in what sense is post theory, I mean, is theory post theory? That's the point that I'd like to just talk about and then move on. See, um, the post theory suggests that theory itself can only exist as always already inhabited by, by post theory. What we understand by post theory, the situations we are in, you know, I mean, it's not just about certain terms like post liberalism, post religious society, post, post metaphysical society, or post secular society. I mean, that aspect of post theory does exist, that's relevant. But apart from that, there is something which comes both behind and after. And behind and after, this is post theory becomes theory's primal scene. In other words, in order for us to understand theory better, we need to actually get into post theory. In other words, in order to understand, as they say, you know, as uh, I think it is uh, Umberto Eco says in, in, in The Name of the Rose, you know, while he's speaking about the complex structure of that huge library called Ad Fission. As I said, once you're in the library, you cannot understand. The only way to understand the library is to get out of it. And he compares it to life. The only way one can understand life perfectly is to get out of it, that is to die. 
you know, I mean, the, the point is to get to get an understanding of, you know, what was happening in theory, you need to get into post theory, right? Now, the reason why I courted Hegel is because this is a very, you know, we are talking about different figures here. The figure of the final, final scene is the first figure. It's a perfect example of how a particular thing, a particular thing that happened produces unexpected effects at a later time in the future. Challenging and transforming the, the very event. See, um, Freud's statement is about reprinting of memory on the basis of experience. Freud uses that particular expression. In other words, your memory is not something that is, I mean, your experience is not something that is static. Your experience is a memory that is getting reprinted every time differently in terms of, or in, in the light of new experiences. Hegel was actually talking about the owl of Minerva. Minerva is, of course, um, the, the god, the god, the, the god of wisdom, right? The owl of Minerva begins its flight only with the coming of the dusk. In other words, we are human beings and we live our life non-theoretically. We don't live our life, you know, in theory. We don't, we don't think about it. Actually, the moment we act, is the moment we rest all theories. We think about theory only much later because wisdom dawns after the event is over. You do something and sometimes you yourself ask, why did I do that? Theorization of the event is nothing but a retotalization of the event or the experience. The event in the usual philosophical sense the event is something eventual, something that you cannot plan, something very contingent, right? That event is, is unpredictable. It probably, that event has nothing to do with your knowledge. I mean, it happens to you. You know theories about it. You know the philosophy about it. But what happens is in the act of, in the, in the real act of it, right? You know, we just do it and then we think about it. So in this sense, we are not theoretical beings. You know, we are physical beings. Maybe we have theory. So even in that particular metaphor, the figure of the owl, theory is something that comes up later. When we are about to fall from a cliff, we don't think about gravity. We don't think about any such theories. These are things that actually appear to us once several people have fallen or once an apple has fallen on some, you know, professor's head. But it's not something that it's not something that we think about in real life. While every action could be shown to be embedded in within a network of theories, that's not how we live our life. So in other words, theory is basically deferred action. It's not something that acts at the, at the same, at the, at the time. Immanuel Kant actually captures this in his three critical you know, philosophical texts, like, you know, the um, critique of pure reason, the critique of practical reason, the critique of judgment. We can see the same kind of movement. In the critique of reason, we have, you know, theory or intellect, and then in the critique, critique of practical reason, he talks about how practical reason works, action works. And then in the moment of action, the final moment is the moment of judgment. So how does judgment work? How does practical reason work? How does pure reason work? Pure reason, pure in philosophy means completely unconnected with practice. Pure reason would be theory, pure theory. Whereas practical reason would be its application. So even in Hegel, in, in the Hegelian system, we find the same figure of the owl coming up much later to sort of illuminate what we did. Because the owl appears only at, the end, at, at, at dusk. 
So, post theory enables us. In other words, post theory um, tells us that theory was the cause of the trauma. Theory was where, you know, theory was a space, as you know, theory created a space of exclusion and excitement. I'm sure most of you would remember the 80s and the 90s when to be interested in theory itself was to be very radical and subversive. It was fashionable. It was the in thing. Those of you who have read uh, novelistic parodies of, uh, I would recommend uh, to students novels, especially the canvas novels of David Lodge, like a novel like Small World, or most recently, you know, um, the Shakespeare Experiment, an interesting novel about theory. Or uh, Kristeva's amazing philosophical novel called Samurai. It's, an, it's also about theory because uh, samurai, theorist was a samurai at the time. You know, the, the Japanese figure of the ultimate soldier. So theory was in one sense, when we talk about, especially the theory with a capital T, that sort of belonged or was colonized by figures like Barth, Derrida, Lacan, and so on. That theory was an exclusive space, like in the primal scene, in the same way as the infant was, you know, terrified and excited at the same time and excluded, right? Theory could also be thought of in those senses. Post theory becomes theory's primal scene. So there is a... Um, um, the other article which I mentioned, uh, Nicolas Royal's article, Deja Vu, I'm sure you're familiar with the concept Deja, Deja Vu. He illustrates this beautiful idea. He, he uses the figure of Deja Vu, you know. Deja Vu, as you know, in dictionary meanings, there are two meanings for the word. The first meaning is, of course, something that is a, a distorted memory, an illusion that you have experienced the present situation. All of us have that kind of feeling. I remember when I visited a foreign country for the first time in my life, while I was walking along the streets of that particular foreign country, at some point I suddenly felt that I'd been there. That's an illusory feeling. I know that was an illusory feeling because I've never been there. So the Javu on the one hand explains an illusion. On the other hand, we also use the word the Javu to refer to something that is tediously repetitive and familiar. So there are two figures here, two, the, I mean, the figure of the Javu presents before us two ideas, two concepts of the post. One is, it's all past. I mean, you can, you can see this, the pastness of, of, of the Javu and the postness, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that. Um, as we come to the next slide. But look at these two definitions. These are dictionary definitions, actually. We say, you know, normal conversation, oh, this is really, this is really something I've experienced recently. I know. That's real. That's not an illusion. We use that word in that sense, too. So, somehow, when we came into post theory, we began to feel that what we thought theory was actually is nothing but distorted memory. Theory is never theory without understanding post-theory, just as structuralism is never structuralism properly understood until post-structuralism came along. It's impossible for us to properly understand structuralism in all its you know, uh, clarity without post-structuralism. We can never understand the concept of arbitrariness without understanding uh, the, the, you know, Sosurian paradoxes. Sosur would tell us that every sign is composed of two components, sound and meaning, signifier and signified, and would also tell us that they are like two parts of the same coin, both two sides of the same coin. And then he would also tell us that meanings are created by difference. Right? So there, there, there was this confusion, there was this feeling uh, about a theory that theory is, on the one hand, theory became tedious, very tedious. I mean, tediously familiar. Wherever you turn, you know, there was theory. 
deja vu all over, right? In one sense, false theory is not, as the head of the department mentioned, is not an escape from theory. It's actually a return to theory in order to relieve ourselves of our trauma. Trauma of the earlier, earlier kind of theory. I mean, these are two interesting uh, ways of looking at, I think, uh, psychoanalyzing the very notion of the post. Freud, while talking about the Wolfman case, you know, he, is, he was talking about after whatness. After whatness, or what I mentioned, future anterior, right? The, the, French, the French word is après coup, and déjà was the other. After whatness is a Freud, I mean, you know, uh, or, or partners. Am I, am I audible? Am I audible? Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. Afterwardness or deferred action is a mode of belated understanding or a retroactive attribution of sexual or traumatic meaning to earlier events. Translated as deferred action, retroaction, apricou, afterburn. In other words, this is how we understand theory through post theory. What were we doing when we were doing theory to understand that? And what did we do now? What are, how, how, how have we changed? So this whole concept of retroactive attribution is contained in the phrase post, in the expression post. Now, this is what Freud said, memory is reprinted, so to speak, in accordance with later experience. So we are, uh, you know, we are retotalizing our experiences of theory days in the post theory. But then this is, this, this is, just the two dimensions that we have been speaking about, the spatial dimension and the temporal dimension. When we move on to uh, Derrida, you know, there is a, there's a different dimension to the whole concept of postality, what Jeffrey Bennington calls postal politics, referring to the idea of the post in his interesting collection of essays on uh, titled Nation and Narration, you know, by Homi Kebaba. You have an interesting article by Jeffrey Bennington called Postal that's the title of it, The Postal Politics and the Institution of the Nation, where he talks about the politics connected to that. What really happens? What does it do to the way we do politics? In what sense, you know, theory helped us? Or once we, we are past theory, what does that mean? The time for reflection, says Derrida, is also the time is also the chance for turning back on the very conditions of reflection. This is something very new in all the senses of that word. We used to reflect, but we never looked at the basis or the fundamental you know, foundations of a reflection. We continue to, you know, but theory enabled us to look at the foundations or foundational conditions of our thinking. As if, with the help of a new optical device, one could finally see sight. As if, with the help of a, an optical, new optical device, we could not only view the natural landscape and the city, the bridge and the abyss, but could view viewing. And this, this particular lecture, which was later published as a book called The Eye of the University, Ice of the University was, I think, in one of the famous American universities. It was, a, it was a paper presented at one of the very famous universities. While he was going to that particular university uh, where Dr. Oh, I mean, Jonathan Culler is working at the moment, um, you know, in America, uh, it's the university is um, situated on the top of a hill. So, um, you know, um, there's a bridge that connects the hill and the city. And while um, he was going to the university, he found that there was a bridge there. And the bridge was so huge. And since the, you know, there was a kind of a ravine, um, there was a, there was a, an, a literal abyss there. A literal abyss. You know, ab abyss is that state of bottomlessness. You look deep into it and you can't see a bottom really. You can 
you know what abyss means abyss is a is a very uh, popular and favorite term in deconstruction because for, for deconstruction deconstruction was always gazing into the abyss imagine yourself gazing deeply into a into a deep well and you cannot see the end of it the final and that's that's the abyss when the ground behind you under your feet i mean is removed you are in the abyss so he was talking about the bridge and the abyss because he wanted to know why there was if, if something that attracted his is is you know mind was is is observation that came, something that he observed at that time was that with the bridge there was a suicide barrier so he was he was he found it very interesting one of the best university in the world universities in the world and next to it a huge a beautiful bridge and with a suicide barrier right there why why should people commit suicide why should people why should there or why should we prevent people from commit suicide why should there be a suicide barrier right there he was talking about it. because the reason is that bridge is of course beautiful it, it it's, a, it's a nice experience but when you look down deep from the bridge you are looking at the abyss and the abyss at least as nishche said looks back at, at some people when you look deep into the abyss the abyss gazes back into you i mean it means that you are attracted and you probably might commit suicide in other words the reason why this university was situated on top of the top of a hill is probably you know we have seen that all over the world right even in india i don't know now things have changed because we don't have schools built on the top of mountains and so on i think people think of other factors right we have now uh, schools and colleges right in the middle of the city uh, you know they 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 more like teaching shops and um, uh, teaching shops and degree shops and so on but that is not the earlier it was a place from where probably you could view viewing a place at the top from where you could look down like you would probably look down from the top of uh, a tower top of eiffel tower for example and see the whole of paris you know in the outline from um, the kind of the kind of experience that uh, you know uh, in the book uh the uh, walking in the city in that article in that essay you know in his in his famous book uh, michel de certo's famous book called the practice of everyday life he talks about you know someone standing on the top of the embassy state building and looking at the city you know view viewing this is something that we were not able to do in other words post structuralism or derrida and and so called company with their high theory taught us how to look at the foundations of how views are created so that's a new kind of an optical device that we have got right now we might take this for granted right but we have entered into that so there are two ways of looking at two other ways of looking at postality that is epistemologically and chronologically Right. we've already talked about this a little bit chronologically it's something that comes after something else but epistemologically i mean the way we know things has also changed this is some preliminary remarks about how to look at this whole notion of post theory now um you know probably one of the most powerful confrontations between theory and the reason why we entered post theory would be the emergence of culture studies we'll be looking very quickly at some of those discourses foundational discourses the only theory worth having is that which you have to fight off not that which you speak with profound fluency so when you look at post theory the post theory situation you know you need to really look at it in one sense from a culturally culture studies perspective it was culture studies that really i think disciplines like culture studies and a number of other discourses they not only really used those theoretical discourses those post structural ideas um they also showed us the excesses of um you know a, some kind of obsessive focus on theory for itself what is called high theory you know capital theory with a capital t 
Stotthold said, the only theory worth having is that which you have to fight off, not that which you speak with profound fluency. So I think as you move from theory to post theory, it is not enough that you know what the theories are, that you, you know, speak about those theories with profound fluency. That's not enough. You need to learn to theorize, theorize as well. And how can you theorize? The theorizing or the new way of thinking about something can occur only when you are actually willing to fight off existing theories. So cultural studies, cultural studies was actually a serious interventional move in the direction of, you know, theory had already taken the academy in one sense into the ivory tower with nothing practical to do with, I mean, the, um, you know, with the excess of the new critical modes of textual analysis and appreciation. We had already logged ourselves, the academy, I mean, behind the, inside the walls of the university. We were never bothered about why a poet, I mean, intention was not looked at. We, why a poet wrote what he wrote, um, you know, why people responded to a particular work, the way they responded. These things were not considered at all. So new criticism had already taken us away from real life. School, colleges had become uh, a place where teachers spoke about the, you know, um, the, the, the work of art, or the novel, and so on and so forth, in a way that is self-sufficient, you know, the famous book, the self-sufficient art, art, artifact. That is the idea. In other words, we find that with culture studies, there is a res culture studies begins with a kind of a resistance to theory. That doesn't mean that uh, culture studies did not use, you know, culture studies is an anti-disciplinary or a post-disciplinary or an interdisciplinary uh, discipline or even an indiscipline as it is often called because it refuses to be bound by any particular discourse so uh, culture studies in one sense represents the ultimate in the disciplinary impulse impetus so what you need to do as you as a culture studies student what you need to do is to know the theories that are there it's good but it's not enough that you speak about those theories with profound fluency. It's not enough that you introduce the concept of Derrida, Lacan, and so on with profound fluency. You need also to learn to fight those theories. That's when you become post-theory or go beyond theory there. So culture studies gives us another picture of how to go beyond theory and how to be in post-theory in one sense. You know, post-structuralism told us that sentences do not, you know, they do not give us any kind of certainties. Certainties are infinitely deferred and so on. But culture studies told us that may be true. You can, you know, you can argue that out. But in real life, everyone has to put an end to the sentence to say something. So there is a necessity to meaning of the end of the sentence. If you do not end a sentence, People will wait for you to end that sentence because it's only when you end the sentence you mean something. That is why culture studies, one of the most important aspects of culture studies, is what is what is called positionality. You know, they take positions, strong positions, and they they give importance to conjuncture. Conjuncture is the is the you know appearance of a particular problem in a definite context, and they respond to that conjuncture. They don't talk philosophy. They just focus on what really happened. Why did this happen? This particular event, why did it happen? So conject conjunctural politics. Is it possible for there to be action or identity in the world without arbitrary closures? Every closure is arbitrary, we know, because we put an end to the sentence at some point. But is it possible for us to take a stand without so culture studies, in fact, taught us how to take a stand on issues. That was culture studies way of moving us away from theory or pushing us past theory. Because they told us that sentences do not move from one to the other without resting without and sentences do not keep sliding away from one to the other. No sentences come to an end. 
And when a sentence is ended, a particular stand is taken, a particular point of view is arrived at. Without that point of view, so um, during theory days, people consider taking a stand as fascist. You know, don't take a stand, leave it open. So certainties, there are no certainties, and we all know the damage that has been that is already done to you know uh, to to the to contemporary to the contemporary world. In one sense, the return of the emotions in political life, you know, with books like political emotions and so on. The violence, you know, the problems of othering and etc. etc. You know. They even consider that this all probably because of of this theory's unethical dimension. So um, let's move on to the foundations now. What I'm trying to do in the next, uh, you know, twenty minutes, uh, um, especially students, especially for beginners of theory, um, they need to understand that theory is not something that is totally unrelated to human life. Theory is all about human life. The problem why theory is often extremely complex for most of the new novice learners, you know, is that it talks about things that are not directly connected to what we have always understood to constitute literature. With the emergence of theory, we actually, without an understanding of of these four dimensions, you know, again, they are not the only dimensions, you know, they branch off into many other dimensions. How can we live without mind and body? None of us, you know, no human being can live completely restricted to one discipline. Right. We need to know a little about mind, body, health, uh, technology. We you know all these discourses. We are, we are familiar with all these discourses. The moment you start learning theory, you find it difficult to understand because it branches off, it takes us uh, away from literature into psychoanalysis, into phenomenology, you know, into how mind and body works and so on. But if you look at them closely, these four discourses, I would say foundations of literary and cultural discourses, they're all, you know, fundamental to our human life. We all have a mind and body, and we need to understand how that works, how that fails to work. Psychoanalysis tells us how that works. Phenomenology tells us how that works. You know, there are there are very interesting theories about how. I mean, there are there is we have a body that is present, and we have an absent body, uh, and so many concepts are there that we need to be familiar with. That's one of the reasons why theory is challenging, you know. Then language and culture. Again, you know, um, we are basically, as Lacan puts it, speaking beings. Even when we speak about the history of humanity, we speak about the history of speaking humanity. So language is not just a tool that we use. Language is something that is embedded within the culture, you know. As Heidegger would say, uh, we we won't, we don't speak language. Language speaks us because language is so powerful. It's impossible for us to ignore the rules of language. It operates on the basis of an invisible system, which all of us follow unconsciously. I mean, the more unconscious we are about our language, the language we speak the more effective we are. Consciousness is not. This is exactly what, this is one of the fundamental insights of psychoanalysis. When Freud invented the unconscious, you know, we were disturbed because we thought that there's nothing, unconscious is not what controls us. But in fact, unconsciousness is what, to be unconscious, to be able to do something unconscious, what is known as unconscious competence is the height of competence. Think about the way you walk home from your from your hometown. You have walked that distance, that route, 
you know, for for many years, you don't think about the route, you don't think about the pathways, because they've all been made part of your unconscious. So to make something part of the unconscious, you know, we have an ethical unconscious that tells us something is wrong. We call it conscience. So language, culture, they permeate each other. And that there is a powerful discourse on language. We need to be familiar with the fundamentals of this discourse. And then there is the gender problem. Again, it's part of our life. We are, you know, either men or women, and our lives are actually structured around this particular center, man, woman. And we need to understand some, at least some fundamental, you know, as, aspects of the gender question. I, you know, it, it, it uh, later develops into LGBTQ and, and so many other discourses, but there, there is this fundamental understanding that's essential in theory. And finally, we need to know about our society and how it works. And we need to know our history because our, we are part of our history. There is a pastness in which, you know, which, which is always activated in the present. You know, like, like the primal scene. It's always there. Pastness is, past is not something, something finished technically. You know, most historians and also philosophers like Zizek would talk about how a history is never finished. History is in the making, in, the pro in, a, in, a, in a process. What does that mean? Just try to think about the primal scene. It's just like that. Primal scene is a scene that happened when you were an infant. But when do you know what it means? Much, much later. That's how history comes back to us. I mean, we need to understand history. We need to understand, you know, so Marxism could be part of culture studies as well, because culture studies makes use of it. So these are all these are all overlapping territories of or terrains of knowledge, different discourses. What I would like to do are introduce some, you know, uh, yeah. These are the uh, we can talk about these foundational discourses uh, and their their chief, you know, exponents. There are several others, right? When we talk about psychoanalysis, not that Sigmund Freud and Jack Lacan and Julia Kristeva. There are there are many other psychoanalysts. You know, you can you can put feminism and psychoanalysts together, and you know, bring in Mitchell and others. You can uh, put post-structuralism. They're not really you know watertight compartments. They're all dependent on each other, right? We know that you know even in culture studies, despite culture studies resistance to the hegemony of theory. We know that culture studies actually transformed itself using post-structuralist concepts. If you read, uh, for instance, Stuart Hall's coding, encoding and decoding, we know that uh, the central, uh, you know, motivating force of that entire piece of concept of decoding and encoding is, of course, post-colonial post-structuralist concepts like, uh, you know, difference and so on. So um, the terms have been used. But look at the discourse. Instead of calling them mind, body, language, and so on, let's talk about the discursivities, discourses, psychoanalysis, structuralism and post-structuralism, Marxism and culture studies, and feminism. The best way to start learning, at least as far as the MA students are concerned, would be to understand from secondary sources some basic foundational concepts, what we usually call threshold concepts in these discourses. And it'll be easy for them to follow and understand. See, these are the people that we would move on. There are several others, right? I can I can actually add more and more people to each of the list. Freud, Lacan, Kristeva, you know, people who are uh, then Adam Phillips, for instance, is written beautifully about, and he's still writing. Zizek is also a psychoanalyst. Um, so you dissociate, you have Jacobson, you have Derrida, and a number of other thinkers like Nicholas Royal, I mean, you know, Je Jeffrey Bennington, you can, you can bring them all under this umbrella. There are several others. 
feminism, post-feminism, eco-feminism, you know, um, then home of there's so, so many of this. Lesbianism, feminisms, you know, the Boer, Judith Butler's performativity and so on. So this discourse begins with at some point and then still continuing. These discourses are very powerful even today. I just mentioned a few names at all. In Marxism, for instance, we have to mention Marx, we have to mention Althusser, Lenin, Raymond Williams, to at all, you know, and a number of other thinkers, you know. And you can also bring in post-colonialism, etc. That's also a basic discourse, but uh, you can bring that also under structuralist, post-structural discourses. But not they're not discourses of uh, language, by the way. What I try to do are you know, maybe in the next 10, 15 minutes, quickly, I'd like to uh, discuss these four discourses in terms of four threshold concepts, so foundational concepts related to them. I, I mean, it's a kind of an interdiscursive application of the same concepts. In other words, four foundational concepts and four foundational discourses. False consciousness, alienation, constructedness, and negation. You know, the moment you end a theory, what we find usually is a movement from, from product to process. We begin to think about the processes, how something works. Right? Instead of asking questions like, what does this literature teach us about morality? We ask questions like, what is literature, by the way? And so on. Structuralist questions. And then post-structuralist questions. Let's look at these four concepts in the light of each of the uh, you know, discourses, and then I will, you know, wind up. Um, let's take uh, how this works. Psychoanalysis, as you know, was single-handedly founded, fathered or mothered by, you know, Freud. False consciousness is actually a term that appears in Marxist discourse. But then the fundamental thesis of Freud was an attack on the conscious. His most important invention was the invention of the unconscious. In his view, you know, as as himself pointed out, it was it was it was a wound he inflicted on humanity. He speaks about you know three other wounds, right? The first wound being Copernican, who you know took away our primacy, the primacy of the Earth, and said that Earth is not the center of the universe, Earth is moving. That was the first trauma that he talks of, first shock. Then he talks about the second wound, which is the Darwinian wound, who told us that you are not special, you are not unique, you just descended from lesser animals. That was also a huge kind of a wound for us. But until then, but all along we were happy about one thing, that we were human beings controlled by conscious intentions and we knew what we were doing. And Freud comes and tell and explodes that, comes, to a, comes, comes up and explodes that myth. He says that that's not true. What you call conscious is nothing but a repression of the unconscious. Therefore, your consciousness is false consciousness. You are not aware, you have unconscious desires. And these unconscious desires control your activity, control your passions, your actions. So much so that you end up doing sometimes things you wouldn't want to do, theoretically at least. Now, there is also the concept of alienation in one sense in psychoanalysis, especially when we come to, come to Lacanian psychoanalysis. Alienation again is a concept that comes from Marxism. Marx spoke about different kinds of alienation. We'll speak about that. According to Marx, the most important alienation perhaps was the alienation of the worker from, the, from his essence, which is work. But then <clears throat> Freud told us in one sense that since the unconscious rules the roost, since the unconscious controls the conscious, we are already alienated in one sense. A subjectivity is also the formation of something, you know, is, is, a, is the result of a separation from our mother. So there is an alienation that takes place at that particular level. 
And then when Lacan comes out, uh, I mean, you know, uh, enters the scene, Lacan speaks about the symbolic order. He calls it the big other, the, which is language and customs and rules and regulations. He calls them the big other because human beings, we don't create them, but we are controlled by them. So the symbolic order, in fact, alienates us from ourselves. Language, in one sense, alienates us from ourselves because language is not our own. There is some, nothing called my own language. You can talk about your parole, but you cannot talk about your, I mean, your own lang because the basic understanding is that without a commonly shared fund of linguistic knowledge called lang, it's impossible for us to speak. The reason why I'm speaking to you and I am assuming that you understand is because we share plans, the same kind of language. So with the creation of the big other, we are alienated from our own self. Lacan does, does this beautifully by talking about two kinds of, you know, subjects, the subjects of language and the subjects of desire. So there are every individual is alienated from his desires. When he speaks, he cannot or she cannot speak out her thoughts the way she would love to because the language she uses, the culture, cultural laws and customs that she has to follow, they were not created by her or in accordance with her or his desires. So each one of us here is first of all a subject of desire and then as we enter language, as we start using language, we become subjects of language. So there is alienation there. Then also there's this notion of the self as constructed through misrecognition in the mirror stage. Construct, construct. <clears throat> Each one of you is actually constructed according to Lacan through an act of misrecognition in the mirror stage. Therefore, what you are the so-called authentic self is itself alienated. As you are, I'm sure, aware that as the, as the little baby looks into the mirror and realizes after a lot of research that the image in the mirror is different from the child itself, but at the same time is in one sense what the child is likely to become in the future. The child identifies himself with the mirror or herself in the mirror and from that time onwards becomes that image in the mirror, which is a much better, much more holistic, much more, much perfect, much more perfect kind of an image of himself or herself. So we have this psychological tendency to carry with us an image of ourselves, which is more likable to others. This is what we carry with us all the time. And this image is constructed. So constructness, constructedness is an important aspect of, you know, psychoanalysis. I mean, we understand that. And then the other concept is negation. All these are threshold concepts. You cannot understand theory without understanding this. What I'm trying to do is to actually use the same concepts across four threshold, four foundational, I mean, discourses. And you know, um, so that you understand four theory concepts and using those four theory concepts, you understand four discourses, at least they're basic. Freud believed that what we call normal life is actually a negation of authentic life. What is authentic life? Probably the instincts of the psyche. You know, in the id, ego, superego, you know, um, uh, as model of psychology or psyche or the human psyche, we know that it refers to life that is that is you know completely irrational or completely you know uh, out of touch with the cultural demands so there is what we call uh, the superego and ego mediating between the two forces and giving us a life after negating our authentic life what heidegger probably would call in proper life the life that we live you know not as authentic life, life that we live theoretically in our mind, you know. It's easy to understand. It's very easy to understand. We negate 
our desires so that we can enter language and speak something that others can understand. You know, even those people who, who, who boast about being very frank and openly, I mean, open about things, even those people, you know, they, they negate themselves in the actual act of speaking because their authentic, so-called irrational life uh, instincts have to be suppressed. Now, as we move on to the next discourse, let's say post-structuralism and post-structuralism, we can use the same concepts, but it will be slightly, you know, arbitrariness. You are falsely conscious that the word apple means the apple. But structuralism tells us that the relationship is arbitrary. But this arbitrariness is never experienced in real life. We never experience that in real life. We know conceptually theoretically, philosophically, that there is no connection between the word apple and the real apple. But for us, the word apple doesn't really exist. So our life in that sense is, you know, we are... Then when we talk about alienation, which is, a, which is another fundamental, uh, you know, um, aspect of language. I mean, we have already mentioned this. You cannot speak language without disconnecting yourself as a subject from reality. Language is an alien medium. And you put all your thoughts into that alien medium. You know, language becomes a seriously uh, powerful discourse with structuralism. And structuralism, one of the most interesting statements that, you know, uh, uh, or statements from Zizek is that word is the death of the thing. In other words, we do not appreciate things in all their immediate immediacy. We don't. We have no access to things as such. We only have access to words or signs that represent things. In that sense, we are alienated. Now, language is not something that gives us meaning, or a word doesn't contain meaning. Language is just a construct. All the ideas there, they as difference leading to meaning, structure, structure in thought. Our thoughts are constructed within language. Each thought is a construct. It's not just something that, you know, authentically flows out of a being. That cannot happen because the invisible laws of language always insist. They always insist. They, you know, demand. So language from this, this is a Hegelian perspective, actually, and also um, uh, in his book, amazing book called The Space of Literature, um, you know, the famous novelist theorist uh, Maurice Blanchot actually speaks about the two kinds of negations that, you know, language practices in real life. In other words, when you mention the word apple, you automatically, in order to understand what it means, you automatically negate the original apple. So there is a negation working. And if you can capture the essence of that negation, you would be you would understand the essence of conceptualization. In other words, conceptualization is a process by which language gives us not the thing, the thing becomes what Lacan would later call the real with a capital R, the terrifying, the uncanny, the the thus thing, you know, technically it's called that. So in structuralism and post-structuralism, we see this particular concept of language as negation. Language not as a beautiful expression of something, but language is negating meaning through its slipperiness. Meaning is neither fixed nor fixable according to deconstruction, because language cannot establish the identity of a thing, it, it, but it can negate the identity of something. As we move on to Marxism or culture studies discourses, uh, as I said, all these concepts are actually fundamentally uh, germane to, to, you know, or used by Marxism, Marxist scholars. I hope it's Marx who says that our thoughts are not real thoughts. Our thoughts are of nothing called false consciousness. This is the basis of orthodox Marxism, by the way. Ideology is a concept that has developed much further after Marx, with through Althusser and Frederick James and Zizek and so on. You know, they, all these writers have revolutionized the concept for us now. But if you look at the Marxist concept of it, I mean, the fundamental, what is called the vulgar, vulgar Marxist version, 
it is nothing but a failure to think for oneself. The poor worker who is exploited by the superstructure, by the bourgeoisie, who seems to be working for the base, is also thinking for the base. Tells him that there is something called a god, a church, or a temple, or a mosque. So when the worker loses his finger, you know, in a caught in a missionary or something, it's a it's a it's a kind of a punishment from God or a test from God and so on. In other words, ideology is a set of ideas that we did not invent for our benefit, for ourselves. It is something that already exists and then structures our being. This is why Marx famously declared that they know they, they don't know what they're doing, but they're still doing it. As you know, philosophers like Slaughter Jake, you know, in his famous book, uh, The Cynical Reason, etc., I mean, rephrases the Marxist principle and says that they know what they're doing, then they're still doing it. Marx said that they don't know what they're doing, but they're still doing it. So for Marx, it was very easy because the moment they knew what they were doing, they would stop doing it. So the idea was to educate the worker class and then transform them and force them into a revolution. And finally, the class struggle where the rich and the poor will become one and the same. That utopian, you know, orthodox Marxist view. This is the, this is the original, you know, um, the idea. Once they know what the real state of affairs is, once they know that the bourgeoisie is out to exploit the capitalists, capitalist is not giving them the you know charity or jobs is, and they are not gods they are just exploiting them things will change but we know you know at least as strategic and Zizek have told us especially in Zizek's famous book called in defense of lost causes you know things have changed <clears throat> it's not the way we look at it all of us know our politicians are you know corrupt we know but we still go along with the election process and so on and so forth. So false consciousness has been, you know, talked about in different ways. Marx also talked about, uh, you know, alienation. Uh, he's the one who introduces the term, by the way, the way we understand it, of the laborer from the process of labor, of the laborer from others, and the laborer from self, his essence, and so on and so forth. Construct. Society is constructed by ideology, right? I don't want to go into it because time, I think it's running out. Life is negation of the authentic life process, right? So life is a, there is an authentic life process of the real life problems of the downtrodden. They are, they are totally neglected and therefore, you know, um, this is a kind of negation there. In feminism, we understand that life it's false. There is kind of false consciousness. This is the first attack, right? If you life is based on the masculine unconscious. Most women, feminists argued in the beginning that women are not aware. Forget about men. Even that they are also they are also not aware most of the time. But it's advantages to them, so it doesn't matter. But women women also are not aware, are conscious of the fact that their life is based on a masculine masculine unconscious. That the symbolic order is fundamentally phallic and female or phallocentric. That's why Lacan said woman doesn't exist. How can a woman exist within a symbolic or phallocentric system? System invented for men. So that's false consciousness. So life is a kind of a masquerade, you know, repression in the interest of patriarchy. So life, so woman is alienated. She has to rise and fight. Gender is a patriarchal concept. Construct. One is not born, but rather becomes a woman. Look at the concept of constructedness there. And then finally, negation. Again, life of a woman has nothing but the negation. I don't have to explain this. You know, there's so much going on in contemporary politics today of how authentic life is totally negated for a girl, right from the great Indian kitchen movies and so on and so forth. We see how, um, you know, a life of a married woman or a woman in, in, in our own state or our own our own life world is nothing but the negation of an authentic life. So four concepts, four foundational concepts, four foundational discourses. This is just one technique by which you can approach 
four discourses theory. Okay, that's all. It's not a definitive technique. It may have problems. These are you know ideas that I've collected together from places and applied my own you know experiences. Uh, please uh, feel free to ask questions if any. With this, I think I conclude.